So I'm gonna talk about evangelization in kind of a post-COVID plan. You're not gonna walk out of here with a checklist of this is exactly what you're supposed to do to uh, come out of COVID programmatically. Um, I think you've known Peggy and I long enough that that's not how we roll. <laughs> and that's not how Bishop rolls. And instead, I wanted to kind of come at this from a, a deep spiritual perspective. Uh, and if any of you were attending the SEEK conference this weekend, uh, my wife and I had our first ever weekend without our two older sons. They were at the parents. Uh, and Chris and his wife actually came over and spent the weekend with us, and we watched the SEEK conference, and it was amazing. Um, SEEK is a big conference that focused the Fellowship of Catholic University students, puts on every other year, um, and there's usually 20, 25,000 people there, and just amazing uh, talks. Um, I had written this talk over the last month and a half or so in my head, and then finally get, got it all done last week, and then went to the SEEK conference, and now it's really different. This <laughs> uh, focus is really, I'm going to mention them later, they, I think, are the most fruitful apostolate in the country. Um, and I'm not alone in thinking that. Bishop Barron has said that, Father Mike Schmitz says that. Uh, lots of people just really appreciate their model. And so we're going to dig into their model a little bit today. Um, but more than kind of go through the specifics of their model, I hope to kind of show what it is um, more generically. Uh, what I'm going to talk about kind of piggybacks off of a talk I gave at Chris Newkirk's Professional Development Day in October across the street. <laughs> uh, many of you guys were at that. Um, you don't need to have been at that for what I'm going to share. But the, the three main things that I talked about that day, that talk was on evangelization as well, were the, the church's teaching on the new evangelization, which started with Paul VI at the end of the Vatican, Vatican II, um, and really, really took its its shape under John Paul II, uh, who was Pope from, I think, 1979 to 2005. Um, and then it continued with Benedict XVI, and it's continued uh, with Pope Francis as well, the new evangelization. And there's all these tremendously beautiful, inspiring quotes about evangelization and discipleship from those, uh, those, those holy fathers. The second thing that I talked about was some parish evangelization programs that you can run. Um, I mentioned Catholic Alpha. So Alpha is a non-denominational program, uh, but there's a Catholic version of it. I mentioned another program called Christ Life, which Deacon Jim in Merrill, Deacon Jim Arndt, has run. Um, it's a different version kind of of Alpha. I think they parted paths at one point, and Christ Life is a really specifically Catholic program. Um, but there's also some other brand new ones that have come out, too, that are not catechesis. They're specifically oriented and really beautifully done to evangelize adults. Um, and I wanted to mention these two. One, if you're a formed.org subscriber, is called The Search. Uh, it's done by Chris Stefanik, uh, who's one of the best evangelists out there. Um, it's called The Search. It's on formed.org. I just watched one episode last week, or two weeks ago now, and it was so beautiful. Um, and another one, which I haven't seen much of, but all the speakers on it are incredible, is called The 99, and that's through Ascension Press. So I'm going to mention this later. There's no shortage of resources <laughs> available if you want to engage in evangelization as a parish. The third thing that I talked about was that programs are not going to fix things without personal evangelization. So parish evangelization, personal evangelization. And that's really what I'm going to dig into today, to today, is personal evangelization. And again, both of those are vital if you're going to re see huge renewal happen at your parish, programmatic responses and personal responses, uh, but you can't have one without the other. So our focus today is going to be, what do we need to do to be doing right now as we, Lord willing, start to maybe see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> uh, my wife and I were reading a, a novel this winter, and it was took place a couple hundred years ago, and this guy was rowing um, uh, in, a, in a rowboat going through a canal that went under a mountain. <laughs> so this is, this is real. Uh, back in the days of the canals, if there was a 
big, tall hill, and you had to go underneath it, because obviously the water does not go up and down that way. Uh, and anyways, he, he felt like he was in this tunnel forever, and then all of a sudden, he thought he saw a prick of light at the end of it. Um, he's like, no, that, that couldn't be light. And then he finally realizes, oh, that is the light at the end of the tunnel. I feel like we're kind of maybe at that point in COVID now, uh, where maybe we can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so today we're just going to focus on what can we be doing right now to be preparing to come out of this on fire and ready to engage in the mission of the church. Also, Father David teed us up for this so well in his talk this morning. Um, I was so inspired by his words and just the images that he shared. And the, the readings today could not have been better. And our saint for today, St. Josephine Makita, could not be better as well. Uh, I don't know if you know her story, but Google her at some point. She was a slave in uh, the Sudan and was eventually bought by an Italian nobleman and taken back to Italy and then um, became Catholic there. It just became an evangelist and spent the whole rest of her life, she became a religious sister, traveling around Italy, preaching the good news of the gospel. So St. Josephine, Bikita, pray for us as we get started. But we'll start with the prayers well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, you are so good. You are so good, and you love us so much. Creation uh, is just infused with your glory. Today, on this bitterly cold day, um, just seeing the sunshine and the bright colors, we just see your glory, but we see your glory nowhere more keenly and no more, nowhere more truly and deeply than in your love revealed on the cross. We thank you for Jesus, for sending him to save us, to teach us, and to prepare us to bring your love to the world. We ask that as um, we continue to find creative ways to serve you and the mission that you left for us in this time of COVID, you would also prepare us to go full scale on mission when these restrictions finally end and the world somewhat goes back to normal. Yes, that you would just set our hearts on fire, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, animate our very lives, every corner of our lives, all of our thoughts, all of our passions, we give them to you. Continue the work that you've begun in us of remaking us in Jesus' image and help us to set the world on fire. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so I passed out these two articles. One is, what if they don't come back? And if you're at home, Grace should have sent these out as attachments or links in that email uh, last week. But the article is, what if they don't come back? It's by a guy named Daniel Salucci. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, from OSV. And this kind of got spread around the diocese. I think Father John Anderson first sent it to Peggy, and then she broadcasted it out to everyone because it really resonated with us. Um, and we'll, I'll be pulling a couple of quotes from that. And then the other one, which we're going to finish with, is a resource that we put together last week um, called Evangelizing Disciples. And we'll look at the quote on the bottom of that at some point. And then there, we'll, kind of, we'll close with kind of an activity uh, with the questions and ideas on the back. But you don't need to, to look at those right now. We'll pull those out in a few minutes. And if anybody at home did not get those in an email, uh, just let us know and we'll look at those to you after the fact. I think for all of us, there's been so many poignant memories, right? We could take a minute and just stop and think, what are some poignant memories from COVID? So many, right? It's for me, from a ministry perspective, there's one that really stands out. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch, but there's one that really stands out. In one of my cynical groups, uh, we share prayer intentions every single week in our cynicals, and uh, one of the participants was sharing a prayer intention sometime early this fall. And her prayer intention was, it started something like this, uh, I'd like to ask for prayers for all the people who are reaching out to those families that have just fallen off of the map, that we just don't see anymore. Uh, 
We used to see their kids every day. Now we don't see them anymore. We don't know if they're around anymore, if they've moved. We don't know if their basic needs are even being provided for. Um, I'd like to pray for the people who are starting to, to make phone calls and go door to door just to bring them back. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so inspiring. And then she mentioned, these are the school social workers, because she was asking for the school social workers at the public school who's doing this. And I was like, so inspired by that, but also um, kind of crushed. The schools, in some ways, the public schools, are more on mission than we are. And I was really sobered by that. And all of this talk, um, I once heard somebody give a talk on how to give a talk, and they said, when you preach or teach or give a talk, give the talk to yourself. So this is aimed at me. <laughs> this is not aimed at you guys so much as it's aimed at me. And I was so sobered by that. Our public schools, especially in our diocese, have become the hubs that make sure everybody's needs are taken care of. There used to be a time when the church did that, right? Um, but I found that disturbing, but also crazy inspiring. And I want to dig into that a little bit today. I think a lot of us have probably already read this article uh, from Daniel Salucci that I mentioned. Early in the article, he mentions that early on when we restarted Masses, a lot of us were concerned. Okay, great, this is amazing. We get to come back to the Eucharist. That was brutal to not be able to go to Mass. But how are we going to fit all the people in? <laughs> With six-foot social distancing and you know every other pew and all those things, how are we... Is, is are the priest just going to have to say Mass after Mass after Mass all weekend so that everybody can come? And I was convinced that that was going to be a big problem. Has that been a big problem in any of your parishes? I know in my little country parish, every now and then it's a problem. Because <laughs> we have a tiny parish that's, that's pretty strong, or tiny church that's, that's pretty strong. But for most of us, it's not an issue. Now, instead, we're starting to ask, what if they don't come back? What if they don't come back? What if things don't go back to normal? And there's a very stark line at the end of the article, uh, a paragraph which I'm going to read to you. He says, what if things don't go back to normal? And he says, that's an easy one. We don't want to go back to normal. Normal has been a three-decade sacramental freefall. Normal was 60 to 70% of those baptized Catholics no longer practicing the faith at all. Sure, we don't want to wear masks anywhere anymore, right? Sure, we don't want people to be afraid of a, a pandemic. We want this to be over. But if we remember where we were back when it was normal, was it all that God wanted it to be? Friends, have you ever had worked up the courage to look at the numbers of sacraments in your parish over the last 10, 20 years. Peggy and I just did this for a big presentation big presentation we did for Bishop last week. Um, and all of the graphs, these are diocesan wide numbers, not your parish or yours or yours. And again, there's there's some parishes that are, are doing much are much healthier than others, right? But all of the graphs, whether it's baptism, marriage, um, confirmation, Mass attendance, uh, religious ed, and school participation, all of the graphs go like this. And then it dives down even more sharply during COVID, right? But all of the graphs for the last, 30, last three decades are a continual, steady downward trend. Father James Mallon, in his book, uh, Divine Renovation, which we can't recommend highly enough, says, a church that is healthy grows. A church that is unhealthy dies. If our charts all look like this, and they all do, the numbers don't lie, what does that say about what's been taking place in our diocese? And not just our diocese, right? This is true across the whole United States. There's some stronger areas in the United States, but the, most of the United States and all of Europe, Europe's graphs are even scarier than ours are. But what does this say? John Paul II, in his first encyclical, says, In the church's history, missionary drive has always been a sign of vitality. 
The drive to go on mission to make disciples has always been a sign of vitality. Just as it's lessening, the lessening of missionary drive is a sign of a crisis of faith. Are we ready to face the hard fact that something has been going wrong? Everything's not well under the engine. It's, it's, uh, my engine was not very happy at all this morning. <laughs> when I tried to start my car. Uh, but all is not well, friends. That Our church has been enduring a crisis of faith, and that it's intensifying in some ways, is clear to all of us, I think. Father James Mallon, uh, when he asked the question, what do we do about this, says, the church is like an addict. She will only change when the pain of remaining as she is would be greater than the pain of the change. <laughs> I love that quote. So, yeah, I'll read it again. This is from Divine Renovation. He says, The church is like an addict. She will only change when the pain of remaining as she is would be greater than the pain of the change. And that's true of any organization, right? And that's true of most of us as well. I feel like I'm a fairly highly motivated person, but I, I lived with chronic back pain for 20 years because I thought the change of lifestyle, the change of going to physical therapy, the change of doing whatever it took to actually make my back better, I thought that pain was worse than just living with it. And so I didn't do anything. Um, this fall, my mom has back issues too, and hers got so bad that it was debilitating, and she had to have surgery and all this stuff. And that woke me up to realize, actually, maybe dealing with it now would be better. <laughs> and so I went to physical therapy, and, and now it's, it's getting a lot better, praise God. But oftentimes we're only willing to change if it seems like the pain of not changing is worse. And if, if owning the reality of our situation motivates us to evangelize, that's great. If we, if we work up the courage to, to reach out to everyone that's been confirmed in our parish for the last 30 years and ask if they're still practicing the faith, that'll be jarring, right? And if that motivates us to change, that's great. But fear cannot be an adequate motive for evangelization. Fear is, in fact, a terrible reason to preach the good news. <laughs> Daniel Salucci in the article says, Let's name our fears. What if people don't come back? During one sleepless night during the pandemic, I tried answering the question for myself, which went something like this. What if they don't come back? Well, churches won't have any money. And then churches will have to close. And then they won't have any need for my ministry. And then I'll be out of a job. Did you count? It only took two if-thens for it to be about me and my self-preservation. <laughs> then he goes on to say something very profound. Often the fear that lies in the depth of this question, what if they don't come back, is not primarily in our care for souls, but in our care for our own comfort. I felt very convicted by that. Do I want the church to continue because it's convenient for me? Because I like it the way it is? Or do I want the church to continue because of the mission Jesus gave the church? Father James Mallon in Divine Renovation says um, that this type of evangelization, if you can even call it that, is really our last stitch attempt at self-preservation. And he calls that spiritual vampirism, which I love. We need new blood in order to survive, but we aren't actually interested in winning souls for Jesus Christ. We need new blood in order to survive, or at least... Um, it's not our deepest desire to win souls for Jesus. I feel really convicted by that. Because if, if that was our deepest desire, we would already be doing that. Right? I was so inspired by Mike sharing about Medford saying, there's a bunch of families that have not received sacraments. Let's spend our COVID reaching out to them. And there's a bunch of parishes that said, let's use our COVID and make phone calls at every, everybody who's registered at our parish and reach out to them. And some of the coolest stories that I heard were those reaching out, um, those reaching out witnesses. But the thing about fear-inspired change when it comes to evangelization is that it's not going to work because evangelization is us sharing the good news. So, Chris, you're telling us that we're on a downward trajectory. Now you're telling us that evangelizing is not going to work. Very helpful. 
Again, Father James Mount says, a church that is healthy grows, and a church that is unhealthy dies. Can we just decide to start growing somehow? Or does something else have to happen first? Again, JP2 says, in the church's history, missionary drive has always been a sign of vitality, just as its lessening is a sign of a crisis of faith. JP2 says that a lack of growth is a symptom of a crisis of faith. So if we haven't been growing, I think necessarily that means there's been something, at least, of a, a crisis of faith. Faith precedes growth. Uh, Chris and I were talking to the priests on our way over after Mass, and we all said our favorite word from the Gospel today, guess what our favorite word was? Scurrying, right? It's a great word. People were scurrying about, they were so eager to bring people to Jesus. That was not a crisis of faith. That was a, a sign of vitality, right? Disciples evangelize. After we've encountered the Lord, we've given Him our lives and our hearts, and we've been deeply formed in His teachings, when our faith is vital, living, active, then disciples naturally evangelize. One of the fruits of the Sea Conference for me this weekend was hearing Curtis Martin, the founder of Focus, talk about three essential criteria for fruitful evangelization. And I'm going to spend the rest of our time together talking through these. Number one, if I'm going to evangelize, I need to be utterly sure of who I am and whose I am. Who I am and whose I am. Who am I? I am a beloved son of God. And I know that, and I'm sure you all know that, you're a beloved son, or more likely in this room, daughter <laughs> of God. <clears throat> but do I know that? Have I allowed that to totally permeate my whole being? And whose am I? I am his. I am his. He has bought me at a price, St. Paul says. My life is his. Who am I and whose am I? That's criteria, criteria number one. Number two is I need to be utterly convicted that the question of salvation and helping get people to heaven is infinitely more important than anything else I can do to serve another human being. It's conviction that bringing people to Jesus, to relationship with him, is unequivocally the best gift you could give another human being. So the first one is identity, the second one is conviction, the third is the mode, the method. I need to be attuned to the way that Jesus himself formed followers through discipleship. And again, so inspiring to hear about why disciple groups getting started, and Bible studies that are um, relationship-oriented getting started. The way of the master is discipleship. Focus, Curtis Martin calls this the little way, and we'll dig into that a little bit. So again, just to review one more time. Number one is, who am I and whose am I? What is my deepest identity? Number two is conviction, that bringing people to Christ, and especially just being concerned, being occupied, consumed with the goodness and reality of heaven, is number two. And then number three is, is the method discipleship. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I'm beginning to realize that the only way the church is actually going to grow is these criteria, is if we allow ourselves to be radically transformed in the core of our reality about what it means to be a Christian. If I had to sum that up in one phrase, it would be, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was dead in my sin and destined for hell. Father David talked about the, the lure of being universalist, of just assuming everybody's basically a good person and probably going to heaven, which is not biblical <laughs> and is not at all what the Catechism teaches. I once was dead in my sin. I, Chris Herbies, was dead in my sin before my baptism and was destined for hell. But now, by the grace of God, one for us on the cross, I am destined for heaven. That's, the, that's the, the charisma, the good news. That's who I am. That's whose I am. I am his and he is mine. I am his and he is mine. 
That's a covenant relationship, right? We're not going to dig into that right now, but I am his and he is mine. Ever since the fall, God has been striving and working and wooing us back into relationship with him. I love uh, Father Mike Schmidt's daily uh, Bible in a Year podcast, uh, podcast so much. It's been really edifying for me to listen to them. And I love how he's been talking about how from Adam, God's scope has just broadened and broadened and broadened, right? So, so God, as he starts to win us back, starts with a couple. And then with Noah, a family. And then with Abraham, a tribe. And then with um, uh, Moses, a nation. And David, a, a bigger nation. And then finally, in the new covenant with Jesus, he reaches out and wins back the whole world if we will but have him. What does that relationship look like? The most oft-used um, image of relationship in all of Scripture is a marriage. Is a marriage. We see this, obviously, in the Song of Songs, which, as a man, the first time I read that was really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we see it in Hosea, this beautiful book in the Old, Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah. We see it most keenly, though, in Jesus being our bridegroom. God wants to woo us and win us back into relationship with him. And most richly, that relationship is a marriage. But relationship is a two-way street. And we allow him to pardon us as a judge. Most Catholics do. We want to make sure we stay in a state of grace. We'll go to confession. We'll do the precepts of the church so that we're not going to hell. But that's about as far as it goes. And one of the most haunting lines from the seat conference for me this weekend was, most Catholics abide in a loveless marriage. It's like, oh, that hurts. That's why we're not evangelizing. If we were radically in love with our spouse, Jesus, we would be telling everyone about him. I talk about Stephanie, my wife, all the time. You all probably feel like you know her. <laughs> and it's because I love her. I'm excited about her, but we don't engage in our marriage with God the same way. He wants to be our spouse. He wants to create new life in us and through us. He desires union. He desires intimacy. What do we want? C.S. Lewis says that we don't desire too much. We desire way too little. We fool around with, uh, I wish I could remember this quote, it's so beautiful. We fool around with, with mud puddles when we're destined for a holiday at the sea. Our desires are too small. God wants so much more for us. The other image, uh, which was so powerful for me from the seat conference, was Father Mike at the keynote on Saturday night talked about the prodigal son um, uh, parable. It was so beautiful. The other image that gets used so much in Scripture is God as our Father and us as his his sons and daughters. He wants to be our father, and while many have left him like a prodigal son, many have left the church, right, the nuns that we talk about all the time, there's also a lot of us that are left like the older son. We're still here, but we're in kind of an economical relationship with God. We do what he asks us to do, but we feel like, what about me? We're fulfilling our duties, but we're not engaging with him, and we're not loving him. Relationship is a two-way street, and he's constantly pouring out grace and love to us, but we're not, we're not responding with a desire for intimacy. So we can focus on all sorts of other good and holy things that Christians should do, teaching classes, serving the poor, doing service, working to protect and provide for those on the margins of society. All those are great things, and we need to keep doing those things. But the only thing that will actually reverse this graph, and this graph, and this graph, and this graph, the only thing that will reverse the decline is actually making disciples. Making followers of Christ who know whose they are, and who they are, and who are convicted about the goodness of God in heaven. Without that, we can offer all the programs and trainings in evangelization that we want. We could bring in the best speakers in the world to talk about it. But without that, it's going to fall flat. The third criteria that Curtis talked about was the method, the little way. Uh, what I like to call evangelization to our spheres of influence. 
So the, the first time that I encountered this in my own life that I remember, there were probably lots and lots of other instances before this, I was a fall break of my sophomore year of college. So I grew up, um, in a, and my family was Methodist, and we prayed every day, but I didn't really have a strong relationship with God, and it wasn't like a deep part of the fabric of my family culture, our faith. And then I started to really come alive in my faith when I went to college. Um, the fall break of my sophomore year, I was starting to pray pretty frequently and just kind of figuring it out. It's like in puberty in my faith, <laughs> just sort of starting to wake up. Um, went to a friend's house for fall break, and somehow I was the first one up in the morning, and I like, staggered down to the, the kitchen to find something to eat. And my friend's mom was there, and they were an amazing Christian family. Um, and she gave me some food, and we're, uh, I was drinking hot chocolate. <laughs> because I didn't drink coffee yet. And she said, uh, can, can we talk? And I was like, yeah, absolutely, Mrs. Haley, you seem great, let's talk. Um, I'd never met her before. And, and she, she sits down and she looks straight in my eyes and says, Chris, tell me about your walk with the Lord. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. Um, I had no idea how to answer that question. My faith was really... Like I said, it was kind of immature and just starting to mature. But I knew in that moment, and as she asked follow-up questions about how I prayed and what the Lord was doing in my life and um, all these other questions, it's like, oh, this is what a mature Christian looks like. Somebody who's really working to let the Lord actually lead their lives. Praying every day. Reading in the, in the Word. This is a very evangelical context, but it applies to us as well. And, and so I said, i got to be honest, I don't know that the Lord's doing anything in my life. <laughs> but going back to Father's talk this morning, I wasn't cooperating yet. I didn't know what that even meant yet. The way is through relationships, our spheres of influence. We all have family and friends that we may be the only Christian in their life. And if Jesus wants to speak to them, he could just like knock them off their horse like St. Paul, right? But that's probably not going to happen. For one, they probably don't have a horse. <laughs> but God usually doesn't work in that way. He works through the, the body of Christ, the church. And friends, I'm increasingly convicted that I don't take that seriously. I don't take that seriously with my friends. I don't take that seriously with my neighbors. I don't take that seriously with my family. For one, it's scary. For two, I, I just I don't know exactly how to do that. So are you a Mrs. Haley? Are you ready and eager to talk to the people in your life about who Jesus is, what he's doing in your life, asking what they're doing, he's doing in their life? I know a handful of people that do that and do it really well, and it's so inspiring. But I know I need, to, I need to grow in that area. Father David this morning talked about his friend's dad, and I've never heard him talk about that person before, but I've got to imagine that that friend's dad had an impact in Father David's life. He said there was an aura of God's presence about that man. The aura of somebody who's allowed God to work deeply in their life. And so the first thing that we need to do, if if not being on mission is indicative of a crisis of faith. The first thing that we need to do is grow in our faith. Read the catechism, absolutely. Learn the teachings of the church, absolutely. But mostly, grow in intimacy with, with God. Is there, is there already a Mrs. Haley in your life? Somebody that you can learn from? Or in your parish? Somebody who's just always on and ready to help lead people deeper in their relationship with, with Christ. I think if evangelization is going to take root in our diocese, we all have to become Mrs. Mrs. Haley's. I wish I could remember her first name, but I can't. <laughs> uh, and a lot of us are introverts, right? That's one of the weird things to me about ministry, is Peggy's an even bigger introvert than I am, and Grace is an even bigger introvert than Peggy is. <laughs> And a lot of you are introverts too, and so this feels really uncomfortable. But in, as we close our time together, we're going to dig into what are a couple of ways that we can start to do this. 
Before we do, I wanted to share a quote from this book, uh, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, which if you don't have a copy of this yet, buy it. It is, it is so good. It's by Monsignor James Shea, the president of University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota. And just to, he, rhetorically, he puts this so well that I, I had to, to squeeze it in. He's talking about exactly what I'm saying. It's, it's not a question of programs. It's not a question of training. It's a question of desire. He says, uh, one can imagine the apostles gathering for their first evangelization committee meeting. <laughs> this is on page 36, if you already have this book. Agenda, to bring the gospel of Christ to the world. Resources, bishops, 11, priests, 11, deacons, none, trained theologians, none, religious orders, none, seminarians, none, seminaries, none. Christian believers, maybe a couple hundred. Countries with Christians already in them, one. Church buildings, none. Schools and universities, none. Written gospels, none. Money, very little. Experience in foreign missions, none. Influential contacts in high places, perhaps a few. Uh, societal attitude towards us, ignorant to hostile. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, because the apostles had what it took. He says, they weren't discouraged, they were filled with joy and hope. They had great confidence in their Lord, in their message, and in the creativity and for fertility of the church. They knew their task was to be used by the Holy Spirit to grow the church, and they knew the graced means by which it was to grow, and grow it did. So how did the church grow? It grew through preaching, right, and events, and so... I think we have to offer events still. We offer all sorts of great events that win people to Christ, right? Extreme Faith Camp, NCYC, High School Discipleship Weekends, Totus Tuas, all the other things that you guys do at the parish level. But the biggest thing that the apostles did was they engaged people relationally. So with our last bit of time together, we're going to look at this other document. This guy. And the first question to, to remind ourselves of is, whose job is evangelization? And I think for a long time, we've just kind of assumed it was the priest's job. And Father Adam, it is your job. <laughs> but it's just as much my job, and it's just as much every single one in this room and every single one of you at home, it's just as much your job. Uh, this quote from the Catechism, number 905, has become one of my favorite quotes in all of the Catechism. Uh, within the quote, there's two quotes within the quotes, and those are both from Vatican II documents. Catechism number 905 says, Lay people also fulfill their prophetic mission by evangelization, that is, the proclamation of Christ by word and the testimony of life. For lay people, this evangelization acquires a specific property and a peculiar efficacy. For lay people, it's, it's uniquely effective to evangelize. Because it is accomplished in the ordinary circumstances of the world. The witness of life, however, is not the sole element in the apostolate. We can't just show people the gospel by how we live. That's important. But that's not the sole element in the apostle. The true apostle, and we're all called to this, is on the lookout for occasions of announcing Christ by word, either to unbelievers or to the faithful. And why is that? Why can't it just be Father David's and Father Adam's and Father whoever's job? That would be a lot more comfortable for us, right? <laughs> but the Catechism is saying it's our job because we have friends and neighbors that they don't know. But it, it's not just about practicality. In our baptism, we are full members of the church. And in our baptism, we're called to carry out the mission of the church just as much as priests are in a different way. So it's practical, but it's also about the dignity of all of us. So how do we do that? The whole title of all this is Evangelizing Disciples. If we're going to evangelize, we have to first be disciples. And I, I just spent an afternoon last week kind of thinking, what are some hallmarks of discipleships in, discipleship in somebody's life? And these are just some questions that I came up with that were helpful for me. 
So take them or leave them, but the answers to these questions are kind of a checkup for me in my discipleship with the Lord. If I can answer these questions, then I'm probably in a pretty good place. If I can't answer one, that's probably fine. If I can't answer any of them, then I probably have work to do uh, to allow the Lord to be working in my life. What has God been saying in your daily prayer recently? How has God led you in the past year? What's a concrete example? What is standing out in your spiritual reading, in your time, and in the Word lately, in Scripture? What areas of brokenness in your life have you invited God into recently? What about in the past? How did He work to bring reconciliation and bring healing or new life to you? What is one way that you've seen God come through for you or for another Christian in the past month? And all of these are just oriented at us kind of evaluating that fundamental question of what is the Lord doing in my life? If we flip over to the, the right side, the evangelization checklist, a lot of this came from Ryan O'Hara, who, whom a lot of you guys have heard before. Um, I'll send out a link to make a note. He has a YouTube channel. It's, I think it's Ryan C. O'Hara is his YouTube channel. Um, but during COVID, he put up a series of, like I think, a minute-long videos on practical evangelization. Um, and I plundered a lot of it for these points here. So <clears throat> this first one came straight from him. He says, pray for openness to be a witness. Holy Spirit, I'm available today. Use me as you will. Give him permission. Right at the beginning of the day, before you leave the house. Or if you have children, before you get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have a spouse. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I'm available today. Because especially for us introverted people, it's like, I don't want to talk to other people. <laughs> <laughs> but God might be asking you to talk to other people and tell them about Jesus. But if we're closed to that, we're not going to do that, right? Holy Spirit, I'm available today. Use me as you will. I've started doing this, and he prompts. <laughs> he will. The second is to listen attentively to the people you interact with. So many of us suck at listening. <laughs> Myself included sometimes. But people are not going to feel valued and loved, and they're not going to be vulnerable if we're not actually listening to the words they're saying. So the first thing is to actually listen attentively. The second thing is to listen for their heart. Because it's into people's hearts that we're going to speak the message of the gospel. If somebody hints at some brokenness and pain that they're going through, you can ask them about that. I hear you. It sounds like maybe things aren't okay. Do you want to talk about that? Listen for people's hearts. Number three. Offer to pray for people's needs. Most of the people in your life know that you're a, a Catholic Christian. <laughs> if they know what you do for a living, they probably know that you're a Catholic. So you can offer to pray for their needs. I'll share a story about this in a second. Offer to pray for their needs, their hurts, their losses, their desires. And then if you're really feeling bold, and I hope we all get to this point, um, offer to pray with them right in that moment. Could I, could I pray for you for that? Sure. Could I pray with you for that right now? <laughs> and it's going to be awkward, <laughs> but it's way more powerful. Way more powerful. And another thing to do with this is if you offer to pray for somebody, do it. <laughs> but the next time you see them, ask how that thing is going. And say, I've been praying for you all week. I can't stop thinking about that need that you shared with me. How's that going? That's, it's profoundly impactful in people's lives. Um, so I was writing this talk, and my mom had back surgery, I think about two weeks ago now, and it went really well. My parents are, all, are down in Chicago. Um, but the day after the surgery, uh, the medication started mixing, my mom's previous medications and then the pain meds mixed really badly. And it was awful. Um, yeah, I won't go into the specifics, but it was, it was scary. And my dad, uh, she was home, and my dad was just like doing the best he could. He's an amazing guy. 
but it was scary. And I was FaceTiming with him over lunch at work one day, and it was just like, I have no idea how I can support my parents 400 miles away during COVID. And the Lord was just like, you could pray for them. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm already doing that. And it's like, you could pray for them right now while you're FaceTiming with your dad. It's like, no, oh, that's way too scary. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I just started praying that prayer. Holy Spirit, I'm available today. Use me as you will. And I chickened out and I didn't do it. And after we got off the phone, I had a meeting. Um, and then during the meeting, I was just like beating myself up. I can't believe... What a hypocrite. I'm going to go tell all these people to do this, and I can't even do it with my own dad. But I'd never done that before. And it was scary and intimidating. I didn't do it. And so I was like, okay, in this moment, I'm convicted. I know I have to at least talk to my dad about this. So I sent him a text. And he responded instantly. He was like, that would have been awesome. Don't feel bad, though. Let's do that later. It is scary. We're going to fail. But just stay in touch with the Holy Spirit. Don't beat yourself up. That's what the devil wants you to do. But stay in touch with the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing is to share vulnerably about a way the Lord has worked in your life in a similar situation to what you're hearing somebody else talking about. For me and Stephanie, that, that's infertility. We struggled with that for nine or ten years. And so I've had all sorts of great conversations with people that struggled with that or are struggling with that. Whatever it is that you, through your walk with the Lord in this column, have seen him doing... Talk to him about those things. Grow in your relationship with him in those things. For its own sake, but also so you can do this. So you can share that with other people. And another thing that Ryan taught me, and some of you were probably at the net gathering um, when he gave this talk too. He said, if you're unsure about how you're going to respond, just say, I know in my own life. I didn't sound like him for a second there. I know in my own life. And then you're kind of stuck, <laughs> and you have to keep going, right? So somebody shares there's a divorce going on in their family. You're not sure if you're going to respond the way you want to, but you know you're called to. I know in my own life, come Holy Spirit, and he'll give you the words to share what needs to be said. And then the last thing, and all of these are, are equally important, but this one is super important, Invite people to go deeper with you in some way. And I would add, if you're taking notes, in some relational way. Don't say, hey, you should come to Mass sometime. Or, hey, our church offers this event, you should come. Or, hey, you should watch this thing online. Like, those are great things to do, but odds aren't real great that that person's going to do that. But if you say, hey, our church offers a holy hour once a month, I think you might be really blessed by that. When it's coming up, can I let you know? Can, can you come with me? Can I bring you? Maybe we could get dinner beforehand. Or mass. Or confession. Or a follow-up conversation over coffee. Whatever it is, it has to be relational. That's why focus has borne so much fruit. Everything they do is relationship forward. It's not, hey, you should go do this. It's, hey, come with me and we'll do this together. The last thing that I wanted to close with is to go back to that theme of what if from Daniel Salucci's article, just like saying his name. <laughs> this is my take on the what if question. What if societally we had an opportunity, society-wide, where the people in our lives were questioning everything, were looking for meaning, purpose, we're looking for community wherever they can find it. What if we as parish and diocesan leaders had the freedom to ask deep questions and to try new things? What if we had an opportunity in which people were starved for relationship in their lives? What if we had an opportunity in which people were begging to be re reached out to in their isolation? What if we had an opportunity in which the normal idols of sports and the general busyness of life were put aside? That one started to wane. That one was closing. What if we realized we're in that moment right now for all of these questions? And what if we asked God what he needed us to do to go out on mission? 
not only to win those who fell away during COVID back, but to win those who've been falling away for the past five years, the past 10 years, the past 20 years, the past 30 years, to win back our whole parish. A parish parish is a geographical reality. It's not just the people who are registered, right? What if we ask God what he needed us to do to go on mission? And then lastly, given those criteria, what if we gave him permission to lead us into deeper conversion? What if we gave him permission to transform our lives, to transform our families, to transform our parishes? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, you are so good, and your mission for us is so exciting. It's also scary, and it's also uncomfortable. But Lord, we ask that you would just set us on fire, that you would work in us, transform us to a degree that we can't help but talk about you, that we can't help but share the good news. For there is no greater news, Lord, than the news of the salvation that you've worked for us, than your desire for our hearts, for intimacy with us. Lord, whatever stands in the way of our own individual, me, Chris, and everyone else listening and watching, whatever stands in the way of us being apostles in our spheres, I guess he would take that away. However uncomfortable that might be, take it away, Lord. If there's some area we need to grow in, help us to grow. If there's relationships that need to change, help them to change. If there's knowledge that we need, give us the tools and resources to grow in that knowledge. But Lord, we believe that the gospel is still relevant and is still the greatest news of all time. And so we ask that you give us the courage and the zeal and the fire to carry it to the nation starting here. In our own hearts, in our own families, in our own parishes, and across our diocese. Come Holy Spirit. Come Lord Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.